Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Glenn, for asking me to do this. I'm quite honored to have a conversation with such an esteemed panel. Um, I'd like to introduce everyone briefly. We'll talk for about 45 minutes and then open it to the floor for questions. And there will be mics uh, that will be kind of roaming the floor, so you need to indicate that you have a question and they'll bring a mic to you. And I'll moderate the conversation as well. Uh, the questions as well as the conversation. Um, and I'd like to introduce the panel. Glenn, you know, but I'll add that he is Dean and the Russell Carson Professor of Finance and Economics. He was chairman of the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors and the Economic Club of New York, where we serve together. And uh, Glenn is on several corporate boards as well as a mutual fund board. Next, we have Garth Saliner, who is the uh, Philip Knight Professor and Dean of Stanford Business School. He's been the Dean since 2009 and has been a Stanford professor since 1990. Previously, he served as Director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, something that we will discuss in the conversation. And he has in the past taken leave to work in Silicon Valley startups and established SEED, which is the Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies. All of these things will be brought into the conversation. Next, we have Nitin Noria. He is the Dean of the Faculty at Harvard Business School. He became Dean in 2010. Previously, he served as co-chair of the Leadership Institute, Senior Associate Dean of Faculty Development and Head of the Organizational Behavioral Unit and we'll talk about all of these topics as well in the conversation. And finally, we have Jeff Garrett, who is the newest dean, uh, the dean at Wharton. He is also the Reliance Professor of Management and Public Enterprise. He's been the dean just since... in his native Australia, the University of Sydney and UNSW. So we also would like to mark uh, Columbia Business School Centennial, all that it and its alums have achieved in the hundred years, and we'd like to look forward and uh, to see what's next in management education. In some cases I'm going to throw out a question to the group, and in some cases I'll direct questions, but this one's going to be thrown out to the group, and the question comes from where we are now, which is the political primary season, where business has been vilified and bankers hate it. So my question to all of you is, has that had any impact on your uh, classes so far uh, in terms of interest in going into business school? Um, and what are you seeing for the future? I'll throw it out to anybody. Well, I would say that from our perspective here at Columbia, it has not so much effect inside the business school where I think there's a great trust in business, but I do think as business schools, we have a role to play in society to knock back these conversations. You know, many of the biggest social problems of our day are in fact management problems. Mm. It's not that we, we don't know what to do, it's that we're not doing it whether it's about the environment, whether it's about policies to help low-wage workers, which is a big issue in this campaign. So I, I think we have a lot to say as business schools, but I think we have to push back. I chose President Lincoln's remarks as introductions for a reason. Business is hardwired into the prosperity we take for granted. Others? So I would just say I believe the, the biggest problems in the world are business leadership and management challenges. This is true whether you're looking at healthcare or environment or energy, um, uh, education across the, across the spectrum. Uh, we have about the same proportion of students coming to us from finance and exactly the same proportion going to finance. So it hasn't affected the, the flows in, in any way. I think what has changed in the last 10 or 15 years is the number of the uh, students who come to us wanting to bring about significant positive change uh, in the world. Uh, they generally, by the way, don't think of government as the, as the route to do that. Uh, they think of social enterprise uh, much more commonly. Nitin at Harvard? So I, you know, I continue to think that there is nothing uh, 
that is a greater human invention than the business enterprise. If you think about it, it's an entirely voluntary enterprise. Uh, you don't have to buy as a consumer a product or service if you don't like it. You don't have to, as an investor, invest in a business enterprise unless you don't like it. You don't have to work in one. And when the business enterprise ceases to create value, it disappears. Uh, there's a natural process of creative destruction that both builds and makes business enterprise continue to evolve. Uh, so even though there is no doubt that we as business schools have to confront a moment in which the business enterprise has come under attack, it's really important for us to remember that the prosperity of society still depends upon the business enterprise and great business leaders. And it is our responsibility to have to educate business leaders who understand that, that, what, that through the business enterprise, it is their role to make society more prosperous. And uh, shame on us if we can't do that, and we really do have to make sure that when people think about business leaders, they think about them as people who are determined not just to do well for themselves, but to actually do better for society. Yeah, and no, I, I could be repetitive, I'll try not to be. Um, you know, I, I think uh, macro perspective, you know, we're living in an era in which the public, the public role of the private sector is probably going to be unprecedentedly large. Why? Because uh, social needs are going up and government capacity to meet them is stagnant. You know, there are some obvious examples of that uh, in emerging markets. You know, think of the infrastructure challenge, the largest challenge facing emerging markets, I believe, with probably with a single exception of China. Um, if, that, if the full potential of those markets is to be realized, it's going to be through infrastructure, it's going to require private investment. Think about in the U.S., you know, all of our pension accounts, God, a lot's riding on that. You know, finance gets a uh, bad rap for a lot of things, but if finance doesn't do its job, I don't think there'll be very many happy retirees in the United States or elsewhere. So the rising, uh, I think, the rising role, rising public role of the private sector is going to be a defining feature of our world going forward, which I think will increase the centrality of business schools to that world. And you have uh, one of the candidates as a graduate of Wharton, Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, yes, who likes to talk about the Wharton School of Finance, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> when I go into my office, I, I can always use this as a point of departure by saying, you know, I know it's never been the Wharton School of Finance because the thing that's etched in stone outside my office is the Wharton <laughs> School of Finance and. Now, the and before used to be and commerce. I think increasingly now it'll be and innovation and entrepreneurship and analytics, the kind of things that are going to drive business schools forward in the future. So let's look at the future. One of the things that I think we can all agree about is that the cost of business school is staggering. Um, and we'll just get higher as the years go by. So is it a sustainable model to have two-year MBAs with students that are paying $200,000 a year for that MBA? Um, and is it worth it? Well, I think your last question is the important one. You know, in any transactions about value, do you, do you gain from having uh, an investment in something? I think that if you're going to any of the very top business schools, the answer to that question is yes. As long as those schools are delivering an experience that brings the best of what we do in a great university like this with the world of practice that's mm -hmm. around us, that is the experience that people are paying for. If it's an experience that's only learning narrow disciplines one at a time, I don't think that's going to justify it. I think you will see a smaller and smaller number of schools providing the traditional MBA, but much more education outside the traditional MBA. It might be Masters of Science programs, the Financial Times this morning talked about one-year programs. There may, there may be other things, but I, I think there will be a handful of schools that survive and prosper and provide value, but only with a great deal of investment in what it means to have an experience. And presumably the, those on the stage are the schools that will survive. Well, I hope so. <laughs> and some others too, but right. it won't be many. You know, we, we have a, there are a large number of providers of business education today. And if you look at statistics, whether it's applications or sizes of MBA programs, you're already seeing a shakeout. Remember the university world uh, Nathan talked about exit in business. Exit in universities is a more complicated thing that will take a longer period of time, but I think you will see an industry shakeup. Nathan, you actually have done a case study on yeah, the so, rate of return. Yeah, nobody would be surprised. We're Harvard Business School. We do everything by the case method. So, so we ended up writing a case uh, that allows our students to calculate the return on investment in an MBA. And 
uh, we give them data on what happens to MBAs over five and 10 year period, and it turns out that it's a 20% plus ROI, however you want to calculate it, at least from the top business schools. Uh, so that's one way of thinking about an MBA, but I think it's a very narrow way of thinking about an MBA, even though we teach the case that way. If you think about the lives that our students are going to have, they come to us at age 25, 26. Uh, the life expectancy of almost any one of our graduates today is going to be 90. So if you think that they're going to have careers that last until age 75, that's a long period of time, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So if you think about investing two years of your life in a business education that might prepare you not just for your next job, but for a lifetime of leadership, I think that's a great investment. And I hope that as many students will think about getting an MBA and spending two years uh, making the best friends that they'll ever make and getting ready for a life in leadership. And 50 years is a long, long period of time where we'll wish to make good on a great business education. So I continue to think that will be a great investment for a long period of time. But I think to your point and, and to Glenn's point, management education is, is going to have to change. It is changing yeah. to meet that mm -hmm. challenge. So you know, in the, in the 70s and the 80s, students would come to us to, to master the core disciplines. They came to do the finance and the marketing and the accounting and so on. And that material is now well standardized across mm -hmm. all of our curricula. Our faculty have written the books. People around the world can avail themselves of that. Uh, we have to go to the next level, which is to prepare them with the leadership skills and the skills to manage innovation, yeah. which they're going to need uh, to manage a, a lifetime uh, of uh, a lifetime career. In business. Right, and, and I think that'll lead to a bifurcation in the market that we're already seeing, which is that for for schools that can uh, deliver a, a very high uh, return on investment, they're going to thrive in, a, in the new era. But you know, you think about credential, convenience, commodity learning, that is out there. You know, look at the, look at the rise of uh, online MBAs. But you know, it, it, again, I use my hands. It's a bifurcation of the market. Our our degrees aren't convenience degrees. For people who want convenience, they just want the three letters and maybe some commoditized understanding of finance. An online MBA might make a lot of sense, right? So there's a bigger world of business education than the full-time MBA, and I think we have to appreciate that, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that the value proposition of, of the best programs won't go down. In fact, I think it's likely to go up. And Garth, yeah. you're actually offering an, an online business program? We are. It's not, a, it's not a degree program, but we have begun to offer a fully online uh, executive program. It's a program that takes place over two years. Uh, the students take eight courses. So it resembles uh, an MBA a little bit more in terms of the depth that you go into than a usual two or three week uh, executive program. Uh, it is purely online. Uh, the the participants par participate cheaper. through avatars. It is much, much less expensive. Uh, they participate through avatars. They recently had a reunion on campus. Uh, this was the first time they met each other in person, uh, and we got a lot of you don't look anything like your avatar. Um, but, but our experience was uh, reported both by the faculty and by the participants uh, that the, 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 what they learned was equivalent to what they were learning in, in person. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think, can program. I just jump in here? I mean, I, I, this strikes me as being a very important point. I'm just struck by the finiteness of what we can all do on our campuses. Mm -hmm. And in a world in which, you know, the aspirant global middle class is going to increase by one or two billion people, there's no way we can absorb that population on campus. We can use technology as a way to provide access, affordable access, to high quality business education in a way that to my mind isn't zero sum with what we do on campus, it's probably positive sum. And you know, look at the reach of Harvard case studies around the world, it's an extraordinary thing. It doesn't make uh, being in Austin any less attractive. Mm -hmm. I well, think what to do with HBX now? Yeah, so we have, you know, we, again, I think we all believe and clearly all of our schools have realized that online education is going to be an important part of the future of education. We all have to figure out how to play. Uh, so we've decided that uh, what we've at least initially started off with is something that is a pre-MBA. It's called HBX Core, and it's offering people the vocabulary of business, accounting, economics, and analytics, uh, over 120, 150 hours, all online. And it's turned out to be great preparation. So if you have a kid who's a history of arts and architecture student, like my daughter is, uh, I insisted that over the summer she do uh, this course. It at least gives her a leg up and allows her to get started in business. And so you could imagine many, many ways, and I think each of us is at a period of great experimentation. Uh, so I imagine in the next 20 years we'll see uh, a wide portfolio of choices about how people might participate in business education in an online world. I also think it, it, it disrupts what we do here. So for us, 
We've been very active for some time in online education and executive education, much like uh, Garth was describing. But we've found that actually inside the MBA program, there are opportunities to disrupt ourselves. So if you take parts of a class that uh, are more lecture oriented, mm -hmm. you could do part of that online and then uh -huh. spend the time with a faculty member on something much more experiential. So even apart from reaching people and access, just making the product we have here, our own MBA, much more effective, I think is very useful. I think we're early days in figuring out the best use of technology, but it will disrupt us probably in ways that weren't foreseen. What was foreseen was the rise of online MBAs. I don't think that's going to be the mm -hmm. most interesting part of it. I think it's going to be the disruption of the pieces of what we offer and to whom we offer. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add? Yeah, so I, I think this is exactly right. I think that the, the, the leading schools, those that survive, are going to be those that go further than uh, the standard uh, textbook kind of material, which can be delivered very effectively online. So Glenn used the word experiential. I think we're all moving towards more experiential learning, and that's what's going to define uh, the in-person experience. Uh, and that's going to cause a big shakeout in, uh, in, in the business school industry, because I don't think all of the, uh, the business schools are going to make, um, successfully make that transition. Well, one of the things that the accrediting uh, body has said to business schools is be more practical. Um, so how are you each doing that? How are you providing more of a practical education um, to your students? Well, it's interesting in the context of a centennial to talk about this notion because, you know, business schools started out essentially as trade schools. They were very practical. Mm -hmm. And then the move in the 50s and 60s to be much more theoretical. So people like us would start to show up in business school faculties. Then there was a movement to try to somehow offer both, and I think now what top business schools are trying to do is completely marry them. So we, for mm -hmm. example, have immersion activities where an academic faculty member and a practitioner will teach together. Our research centers all have practitioners with faculty doing it. So we view it as not theory or practice, or even theory and practice, but a literal marriage of the two. So I think that's really that's really the sweet spot, not should we be purely academic or purely practical. And you're doing something similar. We're doing similar. very similar things. So uh, the great Andy Grove recently passed away, but for the last 20 years uh, we had Andy teaching a class on innovation with a tenure line faculty member at the same time. They would both be in front of the class literally at the same time teaching in stereo. So the tenure line faculty member can draw on his or her strengths, bringing conceptual frameworks to bear, uh, and then Andy would say, well, let me tell you how that worked at Intel, in my experience. Uh, and the students are enriched by getting both perspectives, as, by the way, are both of the people in front of the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, they so. each learn an enormous amount from one another. And at Harvard? So for, we've been very fortunate that for our entire history we've been devoted to the case method, which uh, in That's each right. class puts students in the shoes of a protagonist and says, what would you do? So it's always been an education where We've never lectured, so there's always been that sense. But now to the case method, we're complementing it with something that we call the field method, which is uh, our approach to experiential learning. So we're getting all 900 of our students in their first year to do a wide variety of things that are more experiential. Learning from going out in an emerging market and working with a company in uh, 14 markets, 150 companies, uh, helping them all in the span of 10 weeks launch a micro business. Uh, so we're trying many ways to make sure that our students, uh, once they have put themselves in the shoes of the protagonist in the case method, then can say, okay, now how can I actually put it into practice? Mm -hmm. And Wharton? It's always good to come last. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we'll I don't know what I can up. say that yeah. hasn't we been can talk about the <laughs> first time. No, no, no. no, 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 um, no. <laughs> I'm just thinking about what it's really like to be a talking head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let, let me just say a couple of stylized things that I, I, I think are nonetheless true. The first one is that universities have been good for a very long time at learning by studying. We're all getting into the learning by doing business. Uh, the second thing is I think for business schools, along with this academization of business schools, has obviously uh, upped the ante on the research side of business schools a lot. But I think we all, we all want, we all have responsibilities as dean to ensure uh, that from our faculty standpoint, there's no rigor relevance trade-off. Uh, of course we should be relevant, but why not be rigorous about that too? And that's, I think that's a sweet spot for leading business schools. One of the things that has happened recently is uh, competition uh, from 
from people that have been very successful in your world, the Silicon Valley world, that have skipped business school and started huge companies. So how much have you found that students decide that they're going to skip business school and just go out and, uh, and start a business? Well, a lot of students will raise this. I do a lot of admissions events, and <coughs> prospective students will say, if I want to start a company, I don't need an MBA. Mm -hmm. I say to that, absolutely false. To me, a by a promising startup, I would mean something that has serious funding, serious prospects. Management of such a company or being in part of a company like that is a general management job. It requires thoughts about strategy, about leadership, about finance, about marketing. An MBA is very useful. Does it mean that Bill Gates needed an MBA? Well, no. And I would love it if all of my students were Bill Gates. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. So I, I actually think that a, a, an MBA is very, very valuable, even if you want to start a business, even though it will certainly be the case that there are many successful entrepreneurs who don't have an MBA. Jeff, what are you finding? Well, I, I mean, Wooden, Wooden's very lucky at the moment to be able to claim some big CEOs in Silicon Valley here, including Sundar Pichai at Google these days, um, who of course has a Stanford engineering degree and an Indian IIT degree, and I think that's a perfect combination for the <laughs> modern world. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, what I think about this point really is twofold. I'll say two things. First one is this notion of scaling, right? We tend to think about the person who has the, the bubble idea as the person who turns a great idea into a great business. That's not the case. All the skills that we have helps turn a great idea into a great business, and I think you're seeing that in the demand for our graduates. The second thing I'd say, interestingly, about your conjecture about young people is, you know, Wharton, among the schools represented on the stage, we have, we're the only one with a large undergraduate business program. We have 2,500 undergraduates as well as 1,700 MBAs. The percentage of our 22-year-olds who go into entrepreneurial careers is way lower than our percentage of MBA graduates, and, and you might want to ponder why. I think it's a, it's a risk aversion thing more for 22-year-olds than for 30-year-olds, let's say. So we, you, you want to dig into that. But I think what it will mean for all of us is that over time, more of our uh, graduates will strike out on their own. And, and our focus on career services for that first job after graduation is going to have to extend throughout careers because more and more people will go it on their own at later stages in Korea. And Nitin, you didn't respond, did you? So I think that the one thing to be sure is that entrepreneurship can be done by all kinds of people. So that history is replete with entrepreneurs who didn't get a great business education. History is replete with entrepreneurs who started their careers at age 22 or Ray Kroc who started his career at 55. So I think it's not the case that the current model that we have of a teenager who drops out of college and creates a great company is the only vision that we should have of entrepreneurship. Uh, so Harvard Business School graduates, 20 years after they graduate from Harvard Business School, 50% of them will have founded their own company. So the opportunity to exercise entrepreneurship remains for a long period of time. For some people, it may be the case that they decide to skip a formal business education. In fact, my own feeling is that we all have to be open-minded about the possibility that some people might not want to consume uh, business education in their 20s. In fact, uh, they will come back, and mm -hmm. Wharton has created a great program for people to come back in their 30s. We have a series of executive education programs as well. Uh, so it may well be sensible for some people to say that in my 20s I'm just riding a tiger and it's worth staying, in business, staying on an entrepreneurial journey. And then at some other point they might find it useful to get a business education. Then at Stanford probably people are doing both, right? They are. So somewhere between 16 and 18 percent of our MBA graduates start their own company straight out of school. Uh, that's about three times what it was uh, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So there is the Silicon Valley bug, but, uh, but they feel that they benefit by coming through the business school for the reasons that Nick Lynn uh, mentioned, which is uh, an entrepreneur is a general manager and you need the general management skills. Uh, if you look at the leading uh, tech companies uh, in the Valley now and over history, many of them have had an MBA in the C-suite. It may not have been the technology founder, but uh -huh. you know, Microsoft had Steve Ballmer, Sun Microsystems had Scott McNeely, Cisco had uh, John Morgridge, uh, uh, Facebook had Sheryl Sandberg, right. um, and so on. So you know, most of those companies find you need the technologist, but you also need somebody who brings uh, the business fundamentals. In fact, you know, there was recently a study done of all these unicorns, the companies that have gotten valuations of over a billion dollars, and uh, it turns out that a third of them have an MBA as part of the founding team. Hmm. 
Well, and you can probably save people time and, and heartache, can't you, by teaching them some things that they might not learn on the job starting a company? Well, that's the hope, the first being that there's a difference between an idea and a business. And so if someone says, I have this wonderful idea for a new medical device or something like that, you know, is there a market for it? What's the strategy? How is it going to be financed? Those are business questions. You don't necessarily have to get an MBA to answer those questions to be sure, but you have to think about it. And I think one of the things that's uh, under the hood, if you will, in all of this discussion is the number of students interested in startups who are not themselves entrepreneurs. So if you ask our students, you know, how many of you are interested in entrepreneurship? A lot of hands go up many more than the fraction starting a business. And I think the difference is they see themselves as providing that complementary skill to a technology entrepreneur, to a medical entrepreneur. And I think that's very healthy for our And, and that creates a, certainly a real challenge um, for us, I think, that I, I've, I've just been looking at up close, you know, which is the first job for our graduates. Um, you know, if, if, if it's uh, Goldman or McKinsey or somebody, by God, they've got a sophisticated HR function and they know how to come to our schools and hoover up lots of talent. It's the, it's the company that's going to go from 50 employees to 500 employees that might, might, might actually be a much more interesting place for our students to work and they could probably add more value, they just can't find that company. So we can do some affirmative action, I think, for sort of smaller company recruitment where our students mm -hmm. might both add more value and have more enjoyable experiences. So that's been a big change for us too. I don't know about you, yeah. Nathan. So um, of the 800 students, uh, counting first years and second years, who take jobs, uh, they go to something like 400 distinct companies. So the, the days when a small number of major employees would show up and drive off with busloads of, uh, of graduates, uh, <laughs> that's, that's just not happening yeah. In fact, the, one of the most surprising things uh, that I have learned that has happened over the last 10 years at Harvard Business School is that last year, 60% uh, of our students took jobs in companies that were 500 people or smaller. Uh, three quarters of our students were the only person employed in the company that they got a final job in. So the large world of recruiting where people would come and make offers to hundreds of students and take them. That just seems to be a world that uh, is going to become a minority, I think, of our recruiting. So to find a way to help our students find that, and the companies, to find that perfect fit between one student mm -hmm. and the company, I think if that's going to be a, a new thing that all of us will have to figure out a way to respond to. Yeah, for us, alumni play a big role in that. So we, we actually right. have barbells, so a company like McKinsey might come in and hire an entire cluster. Mm -hmm. of MBA students, but on the other end are companies hiring one or two and maybe not even every year, and we use alumni coaches, alumni mentors, particularly in the startup area, to help our career management uh, center in that. So I think we're all evolving toward a world that Garth described where it's many more employers and, and we can't rely simply on big institutional mm -hmm. recruiting. So can you teach entrepreneurship, Garth? You've been in that business. So, you know, I think that there are elements of, of entrepreneurship that are probably innate. Uh, there's a certain passion and drive that comes with the individual. You're probably not going to teach that uh, in business school. But the process of entrepreneurship is common to most startups, and you can teach uh, students about that process. And to your earlier point, you can save them the heartache of making the mistakes that uh, hundreds, if not thousands, before them have made. Uh, at a particular point. So we teach uh, entrepreneurship by the case method. Uh, in every case, we, in every class, we teach a case where the protagonist comes to class, the students discuss a uh -huh. situation that he or she encountered uh, in practice. Uh, they explain all the things the entrepreneur did wrong while the entrepreneur is sitting in the class, but the entrepreneur gets the last word and stands <laughs> up for the last 30 minutes and uh, explains why some of those Comments might have been on point and, and, and somewhere off. And these so, are alums or not? Uh, some of them are alums. They're friends of ours, usually yeah. in the Valley, but elsewhere uh, as well. Um, and they are good enough to come every time, uh, every time we teach the class. And what the class will do is it will take you through the process that a typical new venture will go through from where do, where do good ideas come from, how do you filter them, how do you build strategy around it? How do you build a team? Where does the money come from? How do you scale it? How do you put a good board together? And so on. I mean, those are very common, and we know a lot about them from the research that has been done on entrepreneurship. And you teach entrepreneurship. Yeah, I, I personally no. do, and, and uh, much as Garth described, all case method with, with entrepreneurs, and I, I absolutely think entrepreneurship is teachable. 
you can't necessarily teach somebody to have the large revolutionary idea, but that's also not what most entrepreneurship is. Most entrepreneurship is identifying opportunity. It's literally taking a puzzle that wasn't put together well and putting it together differently and unlocking value. That's absolutely a teachable skill by the case method. Uh, how you finance a business is a teachable skill, and how you negotiate uh, with employees, with venture capitalists, and whatever I teach, I like to tell students, you know, you pick one element of a term sheet you like, and I'll take all your money. And so we do a negotiation. So I, I think it's absolutely a teachable skill. Everything but the big revolutionary idea. Wharton? Again, uh, coming last is an interesting place to be. Look, no, I mean, Nathan well, I was thinking. Me. I mean, yeah. I was just actually <laughs> thinking about this: uh, the risk aversion, the risk aversion point. Um, Adam Grant, in his new book, Original, starts with Warby Parker, which is a Wharton MBA startup. Um, so, two reactions to my read of Adam on that. The first one is that uh, these guys were smart. They didn't put all their eggs in the Warby Parker basket. In fact, they all had jobs somewhere else that mm. they ultimately chose not to take. Um, but the second one on Warby Parker is we think about them in terms of being glitzy and cool and social mission and uh, you know stores in Venice and things like that. But the reason Warby Parker was a smart idea was because they figured out there was a company that was gouging price on the back-end manufacturing of your eyeglasses and that they could disintermediate that. Um, so you know, that, that's a pretty savvy move and it doesn't sound like Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm in Cambridge, Mass. It was much more, much more thought through, hedging bets, balancing risk, pretty smart. And Nitin, you talked about the number of your alums that start yeah. companies. So I think you know, we're all in the business of educating leaders. That doesn't, and that can take an entrepreneurial form, that can take the form of great financiers, that can take the form of all kinds of things. Uh, that doesn't mean that we make them into those. You know, we, we educate them just like a great athlete comes with a lot of athletic potential, but then you can train them and they can become better athletes and express their athleticism in all kinds of ways in a playing field. So my feeling is that that's what we do for entrepreneurs, that's what we do for investors, that's what we do for all kinds of leaders who come to us, which is they come to us and we're very lucky that we can be selective, so we choose people with amazing leadership potential. Some have entrepreneurial potential, some have investor potential, they've lived in the markets from the very first day. And I think our job is to give them every opportunity in the two years to learn and to hone and to develop their own capability. So that when they leave, they feel better prepared to do these things. Does that mean that we can guarantee that every one of them will go out and become a great entrepreneur or a great financier? Absolutely not. But does that mean that they learned a lot while they were at, at our schools? I think we collectively would, would contend that that's really what, what we're in the business of doing, which is take your leadership potential, spend two years honing it, and you will have much greater rewards of then going out in the world and exercising it in some way, shape, or form. One of the other things we do is, is we provide exemplars of possible yeah. career paths for them. So when we teach entrepreneurship in the method that Glenn described, um, we put entrepreneurs in front of the students day after day after day. And of course, they vary enormously in their, in their characteristics and their paths. And, and so what you see happen is the students will watch them come through and they will say about the first three, I could never be that person. I could never see myself in that role. But then somebody shows up in class four, or class five, or class six, and they say, well, I could do that. You know, the only difference between me and that person is 10 or 15 years uh, of experience. And I think that's very important mm -hmm. for helping them to figure out how to take this innate ability with the education that we provide and find a path that's right for them. And sometimes you know, we also create a space for people to experiment with these roles. Right? So sometimes people don't realize that they may be an entrepreneur, or they may be an investor, and by giving them opportunities, and I think here, Experiential learning, learning by doing is particularly powerful because we found that many people who never realized that they would do one of these things start up something in a relatively low cost of failure environment, which is what they get at a business school, and they try out a new role and they say, oh my God, I, I don't realize, but I could be an entrepreneur, and then that gets them going. So I, I do think that that's the other great value of business schools, which is, as, as Garth was saying, a, a moment to imagine yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, with different kinds of possibilities as a leader. Yeah, and if I could just add a global dimension to this for, yeah. for a second, you know, do, when we think entrepreneurship, we tend, we tend to think a, li a little bit more locally, but, uh, but uh, I've just been struck traveling around the world, and obviously we all spend a lot of time on planes, at how important innovation and entrepreneurship is in every country in the world. 
So, you know, take a sector like e-commerce, however we define it. Yeah, the U.S. curve is pretty steep, but the Chinese curve is steeper and the market's already bigger and the Indian curve is almost vertical. So, you know, we have, we have alums now uh, driving massive e-commerce companies in India and China. You know, they, they came to the U.S. for an elite business education. It really helped them, but they're, they're adding value in their home countries with touch and feel on those markets. So, so we tend to think geography is less important, but geography still matters an enormous amount, I think. So let's talk geography. Um, it is a global world. Um, does that mean that for business education you need to have uh, campuses and places around the world, or how do you get a global perspective for students? Well, I, I think it, it will vary, obviously, across uh, universities. I think of globalization, like all major parts of what we do, is being about inhaling and exhaling. So part of what we try to do is inhale the world to this place. So that's the students we have, it's the faculty we have, it's the cases we would use uh, in class, but also taking faculty and ideas outside uh, on events, in lectures. We do teach all over the world uh, in MBA and in uh, exec ed, but we don't operate campuses. Uh, in the rest of the world. That's, that's not our model. We are here, but we do offer programs around the world. So there are some of our peers who do have campuses that they call home. That's just not, that's not what we do. Do any of you have I mean, let, let Jeff see what it's like to go second. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's much harder. It's actually much harder now. Um, so, uh, you know, we opened the center in Beijing last year. Um, when I speak there, I always say something, it's the right thing to say, but I believe it very deeply, which is I hope we have something to offer, but we also have a lot to learn, so it really promotes two-way engagement. Obviously, our student bodies, our faculty, this, the panel up here tells you I think three of us weren't born right. in the United States, uh, how global uh, American higher education has been, I think, for the benefit of the country. But I'm still struck by, the, by just the finiteness of what we can do in our physical locations, even if you have campuses around the world, and uh, that's on one side. And then on the demand side, just the demand for high quality business education um, is through the roof globally, and I think it's only going to increase. So I think a challenge for us all and why, why online is interesting is because you know, we want, we, of course we want, uh, our home campus experience will never be rivaled by anything we can do anywhere else or online, but we still, it'd be nice to be able to provide access to a, some of what we do to a many more people. And so, you know, we've been talking a lot about technology and globalization. They're the two forces that are driving business. They happen to be the two forces that are driving business education as well, I think. And Nitin, you talked about sending students in the first year in teams um, around the world. Yes, yeah, so our, our feeling is that, look, students, uh, anybody who's going to be a business leader for the next 40 or 50 years has to learn how to operate in, in a global world. Just to take the American companies, the S&P 500, 50% uh, of the earnings of the S&P 500 came from markets outside of the United States. Uh, while that growth rate might slow, as we expect a little bit of a slowdown in some of the emerging markets, I don't think that it will not increase, it is bound to continue to increase. Uh, and that is going to be true of almost any leader in any country, any company in the world, right? Which is you have to operate in the global field. So giving students a real understanding uh, as future leaders of how globalization operates, some of it you do by bringing the world to them, as uh, people were saying, you know, we write 300 cases a year, 60% of our cases are now global cases. Mm -hmm. uh, we distribute these cases all around the world, so my feeling is that we as uh, business institutions shouldn't think that it is our obligation to meet all of the demand for business education. In fact, I think we should be invested in building great institutions in each of these local markets and helping them get better as well, which many of us have done in, in, a, in a wide variety of ways. So I think that we should uh, celebrate the fact that the world will be more global, that there will be business leaders of all kinds, that they will be hopefully 20 years from now or by the time we celebrate our 150th centennials. Uh, other people who will be sitting on the stage who will have built great business schools in other parts of the world, uh, and we should be happy for that. And Stanford? So uh, I agree with what Nitin said about uh, bringing the world in and, and making sure that our students are equipped to, to manage in a global environment. I think that's true yeah. of all of our schools. We require that our students have an international experience during their first year. Uh, among our current student body, uh, they come from more than 60 countries. That's another way in which we globalize. Uh, the curriculum. 
Uh, in terms of outreach, though, we're we're a smaller school than than most of the others on uh, all of the others on the stage, and so we we just cannot be uh, all over the world. They can't be all over the world. Us uh, even less. So so we've we've picked our our shots that we take specific programs around innovation and entrepreneurship, and we offer them in various geographies around the world. One of the other um, things that n needs to be taught is leadership, uh, certainly in the business world. Um, is it something you can teach? Um, I don't know who. Absolutely. You, again, you're not, there are characteristics like entrepreneurship of a great leader that are innate, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely teachable. Our core curriculum begins with leadership for two reasons. One, as a shot across the bow to a new student, that's why you're here, mm -hmm. whether it's to lead in the social sector, general management in a big company, entrepreneurial company, but also to note that there are things in social intelligence and specific skills that are that are quite teachable. We can make people into the best leaders they can be. And it's only the beginning of a process. Most of the evolution of yourself as a leader is over time. We only have people for two years. So what we're doing is basically winding up that process. I believe it's absolutely teachable. Yeah. I, I strongly believe that leadership can be taught. However, I don't think it's best taught the way we used to teach it, which is by putting up in front of the students exemplars of great leaders. Oh, yeah, yeah, here are 10 of them, pick one. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's how it works for, for most people. So uh, going back to what we said earlier, I think uh, it has to be experiential. We mm -hmm. put our students in, in small teams with coaches where they run through various scenarios uh, and they're coached on, on what they're doing well and what they're, what they're not doing well. And uh, that, we believe, has an enormous impact on their ability to, to both manage and lead immediately when they come out of business school as well as in the future. And the experiential part of, I think, all of our leadership programs um, uh, strikes me as being truly impressive. You know, we, our, our students love going to places like Antarctica and Patagonia really to stretch themselves, but one of the, one of the programs that has most traction at Wharton is a non-profit leadership program where our MBAs go in and sit on the boards of local non-profits uh -huh. And of course, they're small organizations, so those people actually have to play management roles as well. And, and that's, a, that's leadership learning by doing in a way that I certainly hope adv adds value to the community, but it adds value, leadership value to our students as well. Harvard? So, you know, so we've, uh, for Austentennial, we, we came up with, uh, which was in 2008, uh, we couldn't have timed it better. <laughs> <laughs> Was it before September or after? This yeah. was the question. It was right after, so it was yeah. a pretty, pretty nice. extraordinary yeah. moment for us. Uh, yeah. so, so we came up with this idea that leadership is about knowing, doing, and being. So you, you know, you have to know what the right thing to do is, uh, which means making an educated judgment call about a particular decision that you have to make. But then you have to learn how to put that decision into action. So it's about doing. But in the end, you also have to inhabit the being of leadership, which is people have to trust you to be a leader. It's not like you can call yourself a leader. It's important to remember that only others have the right to call you a leader, and we remind our students of that. Uh, and they call you a leader because they trust your competence and your character. So we've thought very hard about how not just to expand leadership as knowing, which I think we've done for 100 years, but as we look forward to our next 100 years, our feeling was we need to get better at learning how to cultivate and to translate that knowing into doing. But equally importantly that we were, we should think harder and I think this is where most of us have a lot of work to do which is how do you cultivate character? How do you make sure that the time spent at business school is as much an opportunity to think deeply about how your character will evolve as a leader and what it means to be a leader? And can you teach ethics? I mean, I know you all do, but well, I mean, can you? Well, I think it's a different you? question. I think that if you mean by ethics and you know, literal standards of behavior, by the time somebody is coming to us 26, 27, 28 years old, I'm not sure that's as much of the right emphasis as talking about trade-offs, situations, uh -huh. consequences. Decisions. The program we do in our core is, ab is about that, I, as opposed to, but, but there are different ways of doing it. Some people use professional ethicists. Our view is that it's best taught in part of business decisions and having business people come in and say, you know, here's a slippery slope that I was on. Very few people in life ask you to lie, cheat, and steal as an assignment. I suppose <laughs> it happens, but hopefully rarely. 
it's mainly about a slippery slope. And so I, I think that you can teach some of these values and trade-offs, but we can't make people into an entirely different ethical standard. Can you at Wharton? Well, we have, you know, we, Wharton's, Wharton is a big place, and I, you know, we have a department that's got half lawyers and half philosophers. I don't know where they stand on this, uh, yeah. on this division, but you know, um, the answer to can you teach ethics is clearly yes, right? Because there's a discipline called moral philosophy that does that. But I think, um, I, I think Glenn's point is exactly right, which is it's much more about application and context that matters. And you know, an example that I've been struck by, it's something that, uh, that uh, someone at, at Wharton has paid a lot of attention to, is this issue of facilitation payments in developing countries. A right, very complex issue. Uh, I, I give you a bribe to do your job. Is that an unethical act? Well, maybe one of the reasons you ask for the bribe is you're not getting paid a living wage to do your mm. job, and the reason you're in the public sector is precisely because you know you can uh, you can extract these rents. Uh, so, so the right thing to do in that context not only requires some ethical reasoning, the kind of moral philosophy move, but it also reply, requires a lot of context. And as you said, the world's a complex place, so, so the context really matters. So Glenn talked about uh, Abraham Lincoln, and uh, Lincoln was once asked, how do you judge a person's character? And he responded, and most people think that the way to judge a person's character is to see how they do in the face of adversity. And of course, he had lived through a period of extraordinary adversity, and he said, actually, I have found to my great surprise that people tend to rise to adversity. He said, the real test of a person's character is to give them power. Mm. <laughs> uh, and he found uh, that, you know, he felt that more often people fail to meet that challenge than the challenge of adversity. So I think we as uh, people who have the great privilege of educating people who will inevitably in their life gain more power, uh, need to have them think very hard about why is it that when people get power that they often lose their moral compass or sometimes stray close to the lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, uh, as Warren Buffett says, there's a lot of money to be made in the middle of the line, and yet people often tend to hit to the corners of the lines. I think we need to find better ways of helping our students understand that as they gain power in a very competitive environment, even people who know not to lie, cheat, and steal can find that temptation abounds. And how do we help them recognize that and then make sure that they can stay ethical even though they know everything about ethics? That, to me, is the bigger challenge that we have to think harder about. Stanford. So I, I would echo what's already been said. The one thing I would add is uh, we have a, a quite successful elective, which actually many students choose to take, even though it's an elective, which we call real-life ethics, which differs from your traditional uh, ethics course in that uh, we provide very, very short cases that evolve over the period of the class. And the reason is that most people do not go into most situations uh, intending to yeah. act unethically. Uh, they, they, they go in, uh, in, in small ways by taking actions that lead them into dilemmas mm -hmm. down the road uh, that ha put them in hindsight in a, in a difficult situation. And so we've tried to model that by having cases that unfold so that they can see that perfectly reasonable looking actions that I took in rounds one and two have now put me in an untenable situation in round four. So this is the last question before we open it up to the audience for questions. Um, in five or ten years, what is your business school going to look like and what are your graduates going to look like? Do you want to take that on? No, I think it's a great question and as a faculty we spend a lot of time thinking about this. I think that what we know is that our graduates will insist upon and we will deliver an even more integrated experience, so less about individual disciplines, much more about solving business problems. Recruiters will say that constantly about business schools, that that's what they're looking for. I expect our graduates will be doing different things and that more of them will be in the younger company world, not necessarily a startup, but you know, Jeff had spoken earlier about the transition in revenue in a company as it matures. I think you'll see more students in that. And I think many more graduates, you know, preparing for different careers uh, over their lifetime, hopefully including the social sector or public service at some point. So I think it'll be very different from the graduation of 20, uh, graduates of 25 years ago. Jeff? Well, I, 
I guess, I mean, we could, I agree with everything Glenn said about what's likely happening in our institutions, but I think the difference between our institutions and business education writ mm -hmm. large will probably grow over the next decade. Um, why? Because the convenience moves for a lot of people in the world will become more important. They'll be less residential, they'll be shorter, they'll be more online. Uh, probably non-MBA degrees will continue to grow. Undergraduate business is a big business. Non-MBA masters, massive. But I, you know, I, I think it'll actually be the, the biggest change to the world of business education will be uh, non-degree business education because of the amount, the continual upskilling that people require in the contemporary world and the world going forward. So a question for all of us will be how much do we want to play there? Um, you know, the, the just-in-timeness of our world with the immediacy that the internet provides gives us a real opportunity to be big players there. I don't think we need to, but uh, we may well choose to. So I think we're, we're going to live through a period of, and we are living through a period of extraordinary change in business education. Globalization, technology, the fact that for a hundred years we had MBAs largely offered in the standard format of two years and now as we all are seeing, it's going to proliferate in, in a wide variety of ways. So as we navigate through this change, I think it's important for, at least I think very hard about this, is that uh, continuity about some core things that we value is as important as embracing change. So for us at uh, Harvard Business School, a commitment to leadership, a commitment to general management, a commitment to a transformational education experience that people can get in residence in two years, that's something that I feel we should be as determined to protect, preserve, enrich, at the same time as we think about embracing change. So, so this is a world in which we have to simultaneously embrace change and remain very steadfast about the things that will make our institutions have made them enduringly important for a long time and I hope will continue to be important in the future. Garth, your institution and or your graduates. Yeah, so I mean, I would say uh, if you look at higher education writ large, um, the way that we deliver education has not changed very much in the last hundred years. Uh, we still have a, an individual standing in front of a class with 30, mm -hmm. 50, 70, however many students on the other side of the podium and the, and the, and the information goes from the front of the class uh, to the back. Uh, the biggest revolution we had uh, in higher education was when we moved from the chalkboard to the whiteboard. <laughs> uh, that's something that uh, some of our colleagues still have not adjusted to. Uh, and, then, and then really being radical, we move all the way to PowerPoint. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, but very much uh, the, the way we've delivered education has remained the same. I think this is, this is starting to change. It's going to change very rapidly. Uh, and technology is, is going to be the driver. So I think schools like ours are going to emphasize experiential education because much of the content that I just described is going to be available in many, many other mm -hmm. formats uh, using technology online or delivered at a distance synchronously. And that is not going to be the strong suit of, uh, of any of our schools uh, or any leading business schools. So we will continue to attract, uh, the schools up here will continue to attract the highest potential individuals who will come for a transformative experience which is going to be mainly delivered uh, through experiential learning. And then we're going to take what we have learned uh, through research and through teaching, and we're going to disseminate that and broadcast that very widely uh, using technology so that I think that our influence will grow far beyond the bounds of our home institutions. Mm -hmm. Let's open it up to the floor. If you have a question, raise your hand, and then stand up and identify yourself also. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is regarding the alumni network. So all the schools here present have a strong alumni network. How relevant is it going forward uh, into the future? And uh, when you, uh, you were talking about the explosion of the world population and the online education, does that dilute the, net the network? Does it make it weaker? Does it make it stronger? Mm. I think the alumni network uh, is key. You represent a good part of it for us in alumni clubs. I think for us, if you think about any knowledge business, whether it's a university or a company, it's about ideas, talent, and network. Mm -hmm. The glue that delivers the experiential learning is the network, whether it's literal alumni or practitioners who are close to us. I think technology is actually a great complement to that. One of the ways we can deliver an ongoing experience with alumni who don't have the time to come to us is by technology. 
you, know, you can always audit a class for free at Columbia Business School, but how many people have the time or the ability to travel to come in and do it? So I see technology as a huge enabler with alumni, and alumni are core to this experiential mission. Yeah, and I think the, you know, I, I spoke about being there for alums uh, in a career sense, career change sense, 10 years out, 20 years out, but I think the lifelong learningness mm. of our value proposition to you will just increase over time. Yes, you'll spend two years, we hope that that'll be transformative, then the network you become part of also transformative for your lives, but our relationship can, t can continue throughout your careers precisely because you won't have to come back to campus to take that class. So lifelong learning certainly strikes me as, a, as going to be a big theme that will bond us even more tightly with our alums going forward. Does anybody want to say? Next question. Um, someone, yes, go over there. Thank you for coming to New York. You mentioned that there is a duality in terms of the great things that you are doing now and also embracing change. How is that applicable now to the admission process and trying to identify people with high potential? So we, we, we have learned that uh, we're very fortunate that the basic credentials have almost become table stakes for applying to business schools. So we know that if you think about GMAT scores or GPAs or where people went to work, that we're very fortunate that for everybody we admit, we could admit five more people if that's all we cared about. So we do have to find the intangibles uh, in people, and, and we have, at least at Harvard Business School, we've learned by that we try and do that through interviewing. So we have two people who interview now every person that we admit. So out of uh, the 10,000 people who apply, we will interview about three, three and a half thousand people to admit a thousand people whom we make offers every year. And so we are trying much harder to try and find the intangibles among people because increasingly at least uh, I think we're all finding that when it comes to simply looking at numerical scores, it's very hard to choose uh, one student from another. Yeah, and we, we went, Wharton went a few years ago to a team-based interview format, mm -hmm. not for its, its efficiency sake, far from it, but because we wanted to see how the applicants would interact with each other in a, you know, trying to make it as realistic an environment as possible. Of course, that creates challenges too because we have to understand about different personality types, different cultural backgrounds and how that works in a, in a team context. But, uh, but clearly with everything that we're doing now in teams, that's got to be part of, who, uh, part of the process of trying to identify potential future leaders. There's a question in the middle. I, I feel humbled. My name is Miguel Schloss, I'm from Chile. I feel humbled after this brilliant presentation. What everyone says will sound very pedestrian, but I have to say, ask it anyhow. Uh, with development taking place around the world, with many problems of adjustments, where there are winners and losers, business is coming under fire in several places. My question about the business school, is there anything that business school could or should do in terms of how they integrate themselves with societies, how they engage the business community mm. into creating enabling environments so that in fact business can prosper and development can take place. Is there anything about that continuum between business management and macro management? I think the answer to that question is 100% yes. When the United States advanced the Marshall Plan, which was the probably singus, single largest reconstruction effort ever contemplated. It was not because of the wisdom of the Congress. The Congress then is now perhaps lacked wisdom in some areas. But it was the business community and it was business leaders. And you don't see as much today of business leaders stepping up on the stage for the equivalence of the Marshall Plan today, whether they be uh, in the environment, whether they be broad inclusion and prosperity, we have many effective and talented business leaders, but not doing that so much. I think our role in business schools is to foster that debate and to bring those ideas to stage. Business people are so much more influential than they think. I can say this with some policy experience. If, if the business community stands up on an issue, they will be listened to. And I think our role, insofar as we can play it, is to push that uh, with the ideas and give them the forum. Well, I think to Nitten's earlier point, especially if you think about developing economies, uh, businesses can and should be the engines of growth. 
uh, in those economies, but, but they don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, and their ability to be successful depends on the governmental context in which they operate. Uh, and so they have both the ability but also the responsibility to help mold that context in a way that makes it possible for them to drive uh, progress and change. That was actually the last question, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to summarize the, the panel. I, was a terrific conversation about how you all are thinking about change and dramatic change and how it impacts your students, your alums, and your schools. Um, that some of the basic things will stay the same, uh, learning and working as teams and learning ethics and leadership and entrepreneurism. But uh, some of the delivery models are going to be different, so stay tuned, I think. The other thing that I'd like to say before the end is that this group has never appeared in public before. Um, so you are experiencing a first. Together in this context. We do get out of our yes. cages occasionally, yes. just so you know. But yes, in this context, this particular panel has not appeared in public before. But they do actually meet regularly and discuss these ideas. So you can be assured that the conversation continues. And and obviously, each institution has a history and a, a geography, and all of those things impact what you are and what you're going to be. And that's part of the reason why you see and hear the differences of how the delivery methods are different and the students are different, etc. So, so we, we're the babies on the stage. We're not, we're not quite yet 100. So I'd like to, I'd like <laughs> to wish, wish Columbia a happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Happy, happy, happy birthday, birthday Columbia. <laughs> And, and also, if I may, con congratulate uh, Glenn on a, a really spectacular run uh, Thank as you. dean. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you.